Okay everyone, what's up? Goldie here. And I'm going to be going over the Short 6 Gamer that we have on the main slate uh, over here on DK for May 1st. So congratulations, we have made it through a full month of baseball. Um, and we got about five and six more months to go. So let's get after it. Um, we do have projections and initial ownership looks loaded to the site, so feel free to check those out throughout the day. Um, we'll have updates as the lineups come in as per usual. So on the mound today, um, we've got some interesting interesting spots here. Uh, again, just a, a short six gamer, so we can do a lot of different things here. Um, as we usually can, and I think uh, we've got a couple of good spots here that we might be able to attack. Um, kind of leading the way on the mound price-wise is Luis Garcia, 9,200. Um, he gets San Francisco coming back from Mexico City, and we might want to consider attacking this um, they had a short little two-game series, did the Giants, over the weekend it, at very high elevation. And their, their game yesterday was in the afternoon. Um, so they have really, they haven't had a lot of travel time, um, or a lot of time to travel, I should say, to come back down from... 7,500 feet, and obviously it's only a couple hour flight or whatever into Houston from Mexico City, but uh, the elevation, it brings an interesting dynamic here, and this is why you often see uh, Coors Field and the Rockies toward the end of the season really start to take a toll on all of the players. Uh, the Rockies have for years now been awful away from Coors Field but and and that really makes sense right but they are also they, they underperform quite a bit when they come back to Coors Field and certainly later in the season because the travel in and out of elevation really starts to take a toll on them um, as you get you know, deeper into uh, the full season here, right? So now, obviously, that's not going to be quite as exaggerated as San Francisco making a three-hour trip from Mexico City back down into Houston, right? Um, not a huge deal, but that's a, a pretty significant um, change in in atmosphere, so to speak, uh, for the Giants here. So I think this is an interesting spot uh, with a very quick turnaround. I honestly expected that both San Diego and San Francisco would have the day off uh, on Monday as we've only got, I mean, Mondays are typically a, a short kind of day. Um was really kind of expecting both of these guys and, and MLB to give them kind of a break. Um, we have the same sort of dynamic for San Diego, right? Coming back down to sea level, and they get Cincinnati at home tonight as well. So perhaps a couple of spots. I mean, certainly initially we'd like to maybe attack Luke Weaver on the mound with San Diego, and... It looked like San Diego's definitely heating up, right? It's certainly 7,500 feet of elevation aids in that. Um, similar to how Coors Field, when you know, teams are cold, they go to Coors Field and b baseball just flies and it, it sort of solves all their problems. We could very well be seeing that. Um, so there's two, two ways we can play these games here. We can attack San Francisco. Number one, they strike out a, a ton, right? Um, with a good arm in Luis Garcia. It's kind of why we're seeing a, a 
pretty solid median projection here. Um, that's a very viable construction, and he's at a playable price tag here. Uh, we could do the same with Luke Weaver, just go after him with San Diego, because Luke Weaver isn't really, um, well, he's certainly not a, a top-tier ace anymore, and he's had a couple of starts this season in his first few, first few appearances that have left a little bit on the table. Uh, he was fine in his first start, did, did give up four, run, four runs in his first inning, but settled down nicely uh, against the Pirates and went a full six innings in that start and, and struck out eight. Um, and his next outing against Texas also went deep, struck out eight again, five and two-thirds, but gave up six runs. Right, So it looks like the swing and miss stuff is there for Luke Weaver. And we've been attacking San Diego with right-handers that have some swing and miss all season. So that's a viable play. We could also go after Luke Weaver playing the other side of the narrative, right? The the one in which San Diego is really going to be seeing the baseball now, and they're about ready to turn the corner, and Luke Weaver's been giving up runs in spades. Um, so we can play both ends of this game. I'd... I'd mostly, I think, on the initial look, side with a San Francisco or Scott side with a Luis Garcia against San Francisco, um, and probably side with San Diego, right? But obviously, there's four different ways we can play these games here. Um, no, it's six, I suppose, or five, I suppose, if you want to include outright fading them as well. Uh, which is certainly a viable construction. So just a couple of things to think about when we have teams traveling in and out of elevation, certainly internationally, that takes a toll on you. Um, these guys aren't just playing games in the same location every night, which is obvious, but sometimes in the uh, throes of the DFS season, we may overlook those sorts of things. Um, and... What we're really trying to do here is play momentum in DFS, and these things contribute to momentum. So it's just uh, something to think about. Um, naturally, we've got uh, whenever Blake Snell is on the mound, he garners a truckload of ownership, um, especially when he's at a, a playable price tag, 8500 and certainly when he gets a plus matchup here in the Reds. Now, we'll get into the numbers. Um, I've talked about it. Every slate when when Snell is on the mound, um, I hate playing the guy, and I st I really don't like it uh, when he is 50%. However, the matchup today and the price tag, and it's a short slate here, uh, we might be opening ourselves to a up to a bit more opportunity cost than normal with Blake Snell, so we might have to uh, eat some of this here today. Um, another few a uh, few more good arms. Well, guys that have had some really good results. Mackenzie Gore on the mound. He gets a Cubs today. Uh, really interesting spot here. Another playable price tag. His strikeout stuff's been excellent. Um, I'm not sure what they fixed over in Washington, but both he and JoJo Grave uh, really turned it around this season so far. Uh, Drew Smiley on the other side of that game. Uh, he's shown some sort of strikeout stuff resurgence uh, over his last couple of starts. Taiwan Walker is appears to be healthy. He did come out of his last start, uh, I believe, with some forearm tightness. We need to be careful of that. Uh, but he gets the Dodgers tonight, and he's not a, a big whiff guy himself. So probably going to be siding with the Dodgers in most instances here. Cal Quantra, we rarely play. He has a 14 or 15% K rate or something like that. Um, I think it's a little bit higher, but nevertheless, he gets the Yankees. We'll see if Judge is going to be back. They're going to make a decision on whether to put him on the DL today um, or make a decision today as to whether to put him on the DL. Um, and they've been pretty poor. So this uh, this lineup with everybody hurt over here, uh, Judge, Stanton, Donaldson, um, they've dealt with, the DJ's dealt with some stuff. The only couple of guys that have been healthy are really like a, an Anthony Vol Volpe and a Glaber Torres or something. Um, so this is an interesting spot. 
for suppression from Quantrill. We've been attacking the Yankees with right-handers all season as well, but uh, really hard to get to him, even at a, a playable price tag here. Uh, but on a six-game slate, you can really mix in a lot of different pitchers. You can do a bunch of different stuff here. So um, if you land on a 7,400 Cal Quantrill, probably not the worst play in the world. Probably not great in terms of raw upside, but uh, not not horrible, I don't think. Uh, and then Tony Gonsolin down here at the bottom. He is probably going to be limited again. Only went three and a third when he was supposed to um, be limited to about four innings in his first start coming off the DL this season. At this ownership, I think this is probably an unplayable number. Uh, even at a playable price, this ownership is probably too high. If he's only going to be limited or only going to be able to go for four and change and, and he gets Philly. It's not a you know an excellent spot either. So um that's kind of a an overview of the breakdown here. Let's just kind of get into the games and we'll go over a bit more granularity on the numbers. We'll start with Cleveland here and the Yankees. Um and and Quantrill at seventy four hundred, like I mentioned, I think he's He's a fine suppression target, right? He's got good suppression metrics here. 360 ERA, 450 XFIP. Um, so perhaps a little bit of raw suppression regression coming for him. But the arsenal is overall, it's not overwhelming, but it's overall pretty good. Cal is a, a pitcher similar to his dad. Just doesn't have overwhelming stuff. And has to rely mostly on sequencing and location to get him through a lot of outings because the whiff stuff is just is not there. He's got one of the lower swinging strike rates for a starting pitcher in baseball at just 8%, translating to a 16% K rate overall, 23.5% CSW, uh, leaves quite a lot on the table, certainly for DFS. And a lot of the time we like to attack that uh, but it makes it difficult to stack against him a lot of the time because he's a he's a a good pitcher here and a a strong sequencer. Um, he's got enough in the arsenal with a five pitch mix here, three different fastballs that are you know his four seamer is pretty good, decent value here. Sinker not so much, but um, it's not a horrific pitch necessarily. This is really kind of where he'll get beat up a little bit. Uh, is with a a bad sinker, right? When the when the two seamer is really just tailing over the um, heart of the plate, rather than sitting on the corner, sitting on the edges, um, that is really where he realizes a lot of the negative value with the two seamer, and that can that can lead to a lot of uh, power to left-handers, right? Sinker generally not a good pitch to opposite-handed hitters. But overall, the fastball mix here is pretty respectable. And he can navigate here with three different types. Um, pretty good changeup because the fastball mix, like I, I said, is, is pretty respectable. So he's going to have an okay change. Really wish he would use this changeup a little bit more, but he relies mostly, as I said, on, on sequencing and a lot of the time with, um, you know, throwing so many strikes, he's ahead early in the count. Doesn't really have to go to this change nearly as often as you would think. Now, he is really lacking in the, in the breaking pitch um, arsenal here. It does have the curveball, but needs to probably add the slider since they're very similar pitch grips to a cutter um probably add the add the slider here now it would be roughly neutral value i would assume but that would really give him a bit more swing and miss against the right side of the plate and that's really where the lack of swing and miss is coming from just a 12 percent strikeout rate to the righties here you can see with the with the cutter He'll throw the right-handed change a little bit, but with the cutter mostly, that's what's inducing so much soft contact, full 20%. It's a really, really strong number. 
and that suppresses a lot of the power, but the cutter is not really a swing and miss pitch, uh, unless you're throwing it exceptionally hard, and he's not, just at 89 here. So, um, no, we're kind of going super deep into Cal Quantrill, and with a, you know, we can't just look at the surface numbers, like the raw projection and and the price tag and the, and the K rate, and just be like, eh, well, we could probably pass, but... Um, I think it's interesting to dig into some of these types of guys on shorter slates because they can provide a little bit of value. And certainly against teams like the Yankees this season, I mean, these are not very good numbers. Um, I actually haven't updated my my numbers for the Yankees uh, over here, but this K rate is going to be roughly similar Um they got uh, they got Martin Perez. They had a lefty yesterday, anyway, so not a not a huge deal. Uh, but 25% strikeout rate to right-handers on the season, 92 WRC plus, and like we talked about, we, they may still be missing Aaron Judge. So um, a bit worrisome here for the Yankees if they can't get things going. Now, obviously, when once the the weather really warms up, and uh, th- they'll probably be fine. But overall, they have not been super impressive still missing some guys on the mound and missing most of their starting lineup so uh they have been attackable and if you land on a 7400 cal quantrill um the the yankees are probably going to platoon a little bit here against him and he's pretty respectable against the left side with a full 20 21 percent strikeout rate um Good changeup, as we talked about, and not overly susceptible to power or a lot of production to the left side. If we are going to go after Cal, it's probably going to be with some righties instead because the whip stuff is so, so low, um, or so unimpressive, I should say. But it's still pretty hard, given that he only has a 27% hard contact rate and that large soft contact rate against the right side as well. So... That doesn't mean you can't play some Yankee stacks here, um, but probably side I think initially with uh, with Cal Quantrill on the mound for the Yanks. Uh, Domingo Herman, 8700, and he gets Cleveland today. Um, these guys as well, like they just they do not strike out, and nothing has really changed from the Cleveland Guardians of last season. 700 PAs as well, 89 WRC plus. Still not going to hit the ball over the wall or really hit the ball down the line or in a gap. Um, when Cleveland gets there, they sequence together singles just over and over and over and over again. Again, And that's how they, they really pick you apart. Uh, but pretty overwhelming production from them and sitting a couple games under 500 right now as well are the guardians high walk rate. So it's still very difficult to go after. It's not that they swing and miss. Um, I mean, it's certainly not that they swing and miss, but it's not that they have a low strikeout rate and a low walk rate. Uh, that just means they're hitting for a lot of very soft contact in a lot of scenarios. Um, but it's a low walk rate, or excuse me, a low strikeout rate and a very high walk rate that makes them really, really difficult to go after, even though they don't hit for a lot of power and don't create a lot of runs. Now, Herman has been a fine arm this season so far. Of course, he had the little bit uh, of a sticky stuff scare, I suppose. Um, and since that outing where he went 6 and a third against Minnesota, struck out 11, he is come back to earth a little bit and in his last two outings uh, against Toronto f- immediately following the Minnesota game and then Minnesota again he was kind of the Domingo Herman we know hover around a K an inning or so and you know run five six innings or so um, so he has been a little bit more impressive than in years past and eking out uh, a lot of really good value here uh, on the curveball changeup mix. Uh, still throwing a sinker. Here's really where he's getting tattooed. And when he floats this four-seamer, it tails right over the middle of the plate, not throwing all that hard. 
is Herman. So at 93, if he can't spot this four seamer, he's throwing it a full 25, 30 percent of the arsenal here. If he can't spot this four seamer and stay off of uh, the heart of the plate, then it's not going to allow him to get to his plus pitches into curveball and a changeup. So um, it's not walks or or strike throwing that we're really concerned with Herman. It's mostly just a bad four seamer. And this team over here in Cleveland, they're all really good fastball hitters. Uh, so I think at a slightly elevated price tag, even though Cleveland doesn't really create a lot of runs, um, I think this is a, a pretty marginal spot here for Herman. And I think the market is coming in kind of on the same page here, lower ownership with a lower median projection for really what amounts to one of the better raw pitchers on the day. But it's a a really poor matchup. And I think Cleveland could actually um, maybe outperform their seasonal averages here and get to him a little bit today. Now, he could also, you know, strike out seven or eight again um, and, and go six innings. But at uh, at an 8,700 price tag in this particular strikeout matchup, we are still going to need Ks on the mound. And I think we might be leaving a little bit on the table there. So uh, I think I would mostly side with Cleveland and a, maybe a little bit of Cal Quantrill. Not like I'm going to force him in. Um but I do think that, that Cleveland might be able to uh, get to the Yankees here a little bit. They've been very, very poor, and we'll see what they want to do with Judge. If Judge is in the list, uh, that almost definitely takes me off of all of the Cal Quantrill, and I'd probably just X him in that scenario um, because the strikeout rate to the righties is so low. So overall, a, a pretty boring game, I think, but if you want to get to some Cleveland, I think those are fine tournament stacks. Okay, let's move on to Cubs and the Nats. Um, decent pitching matchup here. Smiley on the mound for the Cubs, 7,800. I'm still looking to to fade Drew Smiley after, uh, really, I guess, his last couple outings. Um, he did only strike out four in his last outing against San Diego. We talked about fading pitchers coming off of outsized performances to their career and seasonal averages, things like that. And he went seven and two thirds was perfect um, going into, into the eighth inning and struck out 10 against the Dodgers. So wanted to fade him. And I still think that with a, a price tag, it's actually climbed up since that start. Um, that was a day game, and it was a showdown slate. But in his last start against San Diego, he was 7,300, and I was willing to fade him at that price as well. Uh, he only went five innings, just struck out the four, gave up a couple of runs. So um, against Washington here, even though they're similar to Cleveland and they don't really strike out, they create a little bit more, certainly against left-handers. Shorter sample, of course. Um, similar power numbers. But at a 110 WRC plus 15% strikeout rate, this really isn't coming up at all just yet. It will correct for sure. It's very unlikely to be this low all season. Uh, but they're getting on base, making a lot of contacts. Not necessarily hard contact, right? 25% hard contact rate in aggregate is still a pretty low number. Um, and a soft contact rate north of 20%. So it's not the greatest mix we want to see here from a batted ball profile perspective uh, a lot of medium contact and a very low strikeout rate allows them to still kind of circle the base paths a little bit they've got a couple of guys that can run on you down at the bottom of the lineup notably a um a victor robles cj abrams types of guys um and let's see who else do they have you got like a, a stone garrett who they'll probably have in the lineup against um against a lefty tonight. They've been leading off Alex Call. Alex Call, uh, Lane Thomas, they'll throw in there as well. Uh, Caber Ruiz behind the plate. He'll hit from both sides. And Joey Manessis making, finally had a, a really good day yesterday. A couple of base hits, been hitting the ball uh, pretty hard recently. So he's a very playable 
price tag 3200 so this entire team is cheap and i'm not sure we'll necessarily need to get this cheap with full stacks um unless you go too expensive arms on the mound like a luis garcia and a snell or something and you need to get kind of contrarian um i think we can go after a little bit of drew smiley here but i think he's also in play on the mound uh, 7,800. I really don't like the price. The price tag. I, I almost definitely just side with the Nats. Um, and this median projection is is fine for somebody in this price range. This is basically the same number for Domingo Herman, and he's another. He's 1,200 more expensive. So, um, we're seeing high ownership on this, and I think this number is probably getting a bit out of control. Uh, even though the Nats are the Nats are the Nats. Uh, I think I'd still like to go after Smiley and and play some Nats pieces. Alex Call's been great. Jamber's been very good. His better side is going to be the left side, definitely, but he'll hit from both sides. And he's shown some pop and, and shown some better contact skills now that he's getting every day at bats, even though the Tigers tried that experiment. Um, he was a, quite a bit younger. Every day at bats now for Jamer, and he's – performed uh, pretty well so far this season but getting him from the right side not uh, not uh, super excited about that but he's he's still playable 3200 but um best price just to play here is probably going to be joey Manessis at uh, at 3200 he's certainly got the most power of all of them but you can play a, a stone garrett as well 3600 he's got power speed and He'll likely be in the in the middle of the lineup here in probably the the five or the six hole or something like that. So I like the Nats a little bit. Um and would prefer them to a Drew Smiley. Eighty one hundred on the mound for Mackenzie Gore. He's been fantastic this year. Uh and this is really what we expected. He's been a top prospect, top pitching prospect in baseball for a very long time. And finally the the K stuff and the suppression is really starting to show up. Now the walks are a little bit of an issue still. Four two four four two walks, and each of his starts this season. So we have to be aware of that, um, and that's still one of the issues that is, can plague Mackenzie Gore. Now the K stuff, if he's going to be striking out six 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 seven and ten in call it an average of five and a third or so uh those are damn good numbers so that's going to help him neutralize this worrisome walk rate quite a bit but still something we need to be aware of anything north of 10 percent it should be setting off alarm bells and that really hasn't changed um you know you, you cannot walk four guys in an outing and expect to have success constantly uh, we see that creep up with all sorts of guys that have very high strikeout rates notably like a, a dylan cease or even a blake snell high walk rates elevate the pitch count and if you're also a high strikeout pitcher that's great but if you're putting people on base for free you're going to put yourself in into really uh, suboptimal spots and the arsenal here for mckenzie gore four seamer really good right at 95 Hard throw in lefty here, but the slider leaving a little bit on the table, and that's why he's giving up a little bit more power to the left side of the plate. The wipeout sort of um, swing and miss pitch just isn't there yet in terms of raw value. Changeup, also still a work in progress for him, not using it a lot, and it's there, but also not providing a whole hell of a lot of value. This is a good velo delta, a full 10 miles an hour off of the four-seamer. So it, in that respect, it can serve as a pretty good pitch for him, but um, a work in progress for sure. So really only two-plus pitches, and the curveball, I would say, is mostly just a menial value for him. So he's been great, and these numbers, this is a large sample here. So the numbers from this season, he's only got... Um, 6, 12, 18, 23, 26 innings or so, uh, so far this year. So the numbers from last year where he was a little bit more susceptible, um, 
and coming out of the bullpen a little bit, those are still sort of uh, taking hold over all the numbers here. And perhaps we haven't seen the full adjustments in uh, the more recently weighted games uh, to all of these numbers. So um, that's certainly something to consider. And in, like we can't really fake a, a full 1.2 or 1.3 Ks per inning uh, this season. And despite a, a high walk rate, I, I do like going after guys that have high walk rates. Um, this is kind of a, a difficult spot for the Cubs, even though they've been pretty good creating quite a lot. 128 WRC plus against lefties so far this year, 315 PAs, high walk rate for them, pushing 10% in aggregate. Also a high strikeout rate. So this makes for a, a strong tournament spot for both the Cubs and Mackenzie Gore. You could see him strike out six or seven in four innings, but he could also give up four runs because he put three guys on base um, and somebody hit a bomb. So interesting tournament spot here for both sides. My initial gut reaction or gut feeling, I suppose, um, is that the Cubs are going to come in pretty pretty ignored here because we're seeing such high ownership on Mackenzie Gore, full 30% now. Uh, I do like this. And median projection still just hovering about 15 points, similar to a Drew Smiley. So I think we could really consider all sides of this game. Both guys on the mound uh, would prefer Gore for sure. But you can also play both offenses. And I would prefer the Nats. I think if, uh, you know, in order, it's probably Gore, Nats, Cubs, then Drew Smiley. But it's pretty close between the bottom three. I think Gore is leading uh, pretty significantly here, so I'd prefer him in, in most builds. But uh, you could play, I think, pretty much everybody here. Okay, let's move on to Toronto and Boston. Uh, Josie Barrios on the mound, 8,300. He's been okay in his last couple starts. Um, I mean, he was excellent in his, in his previous start, right? Went seven, struck out nine. And this is the Jose Barrios that we really remember from his earlier days in uh, in Minnesota, where the slider has just been a total wipeout pitch for him. And he hasn't really had to rely on a bad four-seamer or a bad change. He kept the He's been keeping the ball down in the strike zone with the with the sinker slider combo, and this is kind of a, a Marcus Stroman type of arsenal. Um, hard sinker down at 94, and and a hard slider that really has a, a lot of horizontal break to it. So uh, when he keeps this down in the strike zone, you can see plus side of the variance here, and this can eke out a, a lot of value relative to league average. It's really the four-seamer over the last year and the change that have been a big problem for him to the left side of the plate. Now, he gets Boston today against right-handers. They've been very sticky so far this year. Pretty damn good numbers. We talked a little bit about this, that they've got some guys in the lineup that they have inserted, um, in particular a Justin Turner and a Masataki Yoshida that don't strike out. Like Yoshida's got, what, a, a 13% strikeout rate so far this year. Uh, Justin Turner has had a, a, a very low strikeout rate his entire career. Uh, Verdugo has a low whiff rate as well. And, of course, they've got Rafi Devers cleaning up um, cleaning up those three guys in the four hole. So we'll see what they want to do today, but they can platoon pretty heavily here against Barrios. And... Despite the fact that the sinker-slider combo has been good, we need to see more value out of the changeup and the four-seamer. You can't throw a full 25 and and 40% of your arsenal, I guess, between the two pitches with this kind of negative value. And it, the changeup has really never been good. He's always been susceptible to left-handers. It's just that when he's rolling, he's keeping the baseball down. Uh, and getting more ground balls than fly balls. But in aggregate, still over his last 100 innings against lefties, the numbers really, they still haven't come down. Um, it's going to take a, a 
a bit more than a couple of good starts. Uh, he's only had two really encouraging outings this season. Uh, he gave up eight against the Royals in his first start, four in his next start against the Angels. And he was good against Tampa, kind of surprising there, when he only gave up one. But against Houston, another kind of difficult matchup in general there with a, a pretty decent lineup. Struck out just three and gave up two runs. He's been going a little bit deeper into the game, which is encouraging. And certainly, of course, the nine strikeouts and seven innings against the White Sox uh, in his last start. But um, Boston is a another difficult matchup for him, and I would say just as difficult as Tampa, who he did pick apart, but um, much more difficult than the White Sox, the Angels, or the Royals, for example. And in those three starts, really he went one for three in terms of uh, – equitable DFS outing. So um, 8300 this is an intriguing price tag here, but very low ownership. I think this is a playable a playable number on a six-game slate because the strikeout stuff and, and the suppression has been there over the last, call it three starts, really. Um, it's really worrisome, though, that they're going to platoon so heavily against him in this spot. They will have one, two... Uh, they'll probably have seven lefties in this lineup, um, and one of the righties is Justin Turner, who, <laughs> who doesn't strike out at all. So uh, kind of a difficult raw suppression matchup here uh, for Berrios, and his median projection so far is about three ticks lower than both Drew Smiley and Mackenzie Gore at roughly the same price. So... It's a little worrisome here in the early projection metrics. Uh, I do like the ownership value on a four-game slate, and you could certainly attack with that because overall Boston is kind of a, a league average lineup. But on today's slate, uh, I think this is a, a respectable stack that you could consider getting to uh, because they're going to make a lot of contact, and it's still two pitches that Barrios um, – Barrios' arsenal does not uh, play well with here the four-seamer and the changeup against very lefty-heavy lineups. So uh, would most likely side with Boston. Uh, Corey Kluber on the mound for them would most likely side with Toronto, of course. Uh, Kluber doesn't have the raw K stuff anymore, but I like this price tag for Kluber. Um, Toronto's really been kind of disappointing. We know they have power, but they are, are really up and down. Um, and there's... There's been variance with Toronto over the last couple of seasons. This year so far, 765 PAs, give or take, 22% K rate, 9% walk rate, still creating, but not hitting for quite as much power as you would kind of expect. Um, Vladdy really hasn't gotten going just yet. He's still at a very expensive price tag. Bo Bichette is is getting there here and there. He's at 5,900, kind of aggressive. Uh, 51 for Springer is, is fine. 56 for Chapman has cooled off a little bit since his early season barrage. Dalton Varsho has really just kind of been terrible. This is kind of who Dal Dalton Varsho is, um, but he's at 4,300, a very playable price. Probably see some ownership on him today. Um, but the guys down at the bottom of the lineup really not providing all that much value. Brandon Belt certainly, uh, he hasn't he hasn't brought uh, really much of anything to them this season. Danny Jansen. Uh, certainly, I would say the the better hitting catcher of the two, uh, between he and Allie Kirk, um, it, and he's been great. But Kevin Biggio, Kevin Kiermeyer, who they've got down at the bottom of the lineup, not necessarily known for their offensive prowess. So, um, I like this price tag for Kluber, and I certainly like the ownership at at four percent here. Um, Kluber still throws strikes. He's not going to throw it past anybody anymore, and he's still susceptible to left-handers. So we can get to a Dalton Varsho. Low strikeout rate against right, righties as well. So you can play uh, a Vladdy or, or George Springer or something like that. Um, elevated run total once again here for Toronto, as we kind of always see against guys that don't strike anybody out. So I wouldn't be surprised if Kluver gets really beat up here. Um because he is still throwing the sinker a hell of a lot, and that is not a good pitch 
to left-handers. So that's going to lead to a good bit of power as we see that reflected here in the numbers. 179 ISO to the left side of the plate and just a 20% whip. So he'll get some balls in the air still. Batted ball-wise, not the greatest spot for Varsho as he's a, a pretty heavy fly ball hitter. So is Kevin Biggio. And Brandon Belt against righties has always been a fly ball hitter. So um, maybe your best batted ball matchup against Kluber from the left side of the plate, that is, would be a Kevin Kiermeyer down at 2,600. And you want to play him in the nine hole as a one-off? I mean, kind of gross. So I think I'm more intrigued with the price tag on Kluber than I am with the batted ball matchup spot for Toronto. And on a short six-game slate at very low ownership, I think he could pop to 18 or 20 points here and go with six innings uh, or something against Toronto, who can go cold um, against you know crafty arms here. We saw that um, Easton McGee tore them apart <laughs> uh, two starts ago. So um, I'm generally not super crazy about playing Kluber. But he has 18 or 20. We saw in his last start, for example, he went six innings, did strike out just three, but only gave up one and, and sprayed five hits against uh, Baltimore. So he can still pick through a, a pretty decent lineup here. Uh, it's a dangerous spot, absolutely. But I think at this price tag, um, yeah, he's an intriguing play. So if you land on a 6,600 Kluber, I'm not sure that I would go out of my way to exit. Um you can certainly play Toronto if you'd like. They're expensive, though, and you got to pay for it. Okay, San Francisco and Houston, we talked about this a little bit. I would really like to get to some Luis Garcia on the mound here. Definitely had a depressed ownership number. Um, now, we'll get into the batted ball stuff here. I think this is a pretty decent spot for him um, against, against the Giants. They're going to hit a lot of fly balls. Against righties so far this year, they're at a neutral ground ball to fly ball so far. Um, that's really due to a lot of the the righties that they are keeping in the lineup. Um, like a like a well, a Mitch Hanniger is back. Uh, a JD Davis who they've been had had in here for the last couple of weeks. Tyro uh, up at the top of the lineup, a little bit more on the line drive side of the spectrum. Uh, then raw fly ball hitter, certainly Conforto, not a mega fly ball hitter, um, just a slight lean. So overall against righties, you, you like they have a lot of guys that hit the baseball in the air, but it's um, it's flattened out a little bit by some guys that will hit it more in a line, certainly like a Wilmer Flores or something. Um, so how we really want to attack with the Giants is against guys that give up a lot of power to the left side. Certain, Luis Garcia certainly gives up that, but more so with guys that will um, that have about a buck twenty ground ball to fly ball or so. In which case, the major fly ball hitters for the Giants, like a Lamont Wade, Jock Peterson against right-handed pitching, um, Blake Sable behind the plate. Yaz, certainly, he'll probably be out since he tweaked his hammy yesterday. But um, the batted ball profile for those guys, you know, they're heavy fly ball hitters. So you'd like to see, in general, a ground ball lean from the opposing starter if you're going after that. Um, and usually, we it's kind of difficult to stack against fly ball pitchers and definitely with fly ball hitters. So... Um, because everybody's just going to be hitting fly balls. And when when there's hard contact, as there certainly is here, so don't get me wrong, there's some susceptibility. He gives up a 208 ISO, does Garcia, to the left side of the plate. So that's what's keeping these this ownership number down, at least in initial runs here. Um, but he's still a fly baller, an 085 ground ball to fly ball to the left side of the plate. Induces a lot of soft contact, so that's a lot of that leads to a lot of pop-ups. And while there is some elevated hard contact, pushing 32% here, it doesn't really translate to balls over the wall. It's mostly in gaps and and down a line and, and stuff like that. So I think it's an intriguing spot for Luis Garcia going after the Giants here. We talked about uh, all of these guys coming back down from elevation and. 
uh, back down to sea level, well, ball's certainly not going to travel anywhere near as well down in Houston um, as it did up in Mexico City. So I think uh, I would rather side with Luis Garcia here. Um, the Arsenal's still fine, still throwing a lot of this four-seamer and really not getting a hell of a lot of value, uh, but has moved over a lot of the... Um, a lot of fastball usage to the cutter here. And I really wish he'd, he'd throw the slider a little bit more. It would give him more swing and miss than he already has. The strikeout stuff has always been pretty encouraging from Luis Garcia. A couple ticks above average here. 25% K rate, and I think we can go after the Giants because despite the fly ball lean or um, neutral ground ball to fly ball and the fly ball hitters, still a 26% K rate. So hitting for a lot of power, and that's mostly because they've been hitting the ball over the wall. Homer to fly ball rate here is massive, 22 over 22%. The league average is about 13% here. So this is a monster number that is very likely to regress. When they're not hitting the ball over the wall, they're going to strike out a boatload, and you could really pick through this team. Um, so I think this is an attackable spot for Luis Garcia on the mound. Ross Stripling on the other side for the Giants, 6,400. Uh, I think it's pretty rare that we play Ross Stripling anymore, and I'm not going to be doing it against Houston either. Uh, pretty low medium projection so far, and the market kind of agrees. Very low ownership coming in. Now, the arsenal for Stripling has always been pretty encouraging. The, the potential has been there, but he just hasn't eked out enough of the value to make him uh, a super serviceable starter. Now, he doesn't give up a lot of power to opposite-handed hitters, and the production numbers there are very strong. Um, it's kind of worrisome that he's not inducing enough soft contact with a pretty damn good changeup here. Full 9, 10-mile-an-hour velo delta to the fastballs is the change. So, um, really to both sides of the plate, using it heavily at a full quarter of the arsenal but not inducing enough soft contact here. And despite a plus slider and a league average four-seamer and the changeup that he will throw righty-righty, uh, still gives up a good bit of hard contact, 34% to the right side. That's a, um, that's a pretty high number. And as we see, 184 ISO to the right side, sub-20% strikeout rate. So uh, he's very attackable with some righties here. And good thing for Houston, most of their hitters are right-handed heavy. Uh, or are right-handed, rather. The lineup is right-handed heavy, certainly. Uh, Mo DeBone at the top of the lineup at 3600 still a very playable price for him. 46 for Jeremy Pena, also very playable. They got Jordan back yesterday. He looks fine. 6300 for him. 54 prices come down on Kyle Tucker a little bit. 44 for Alex Bregman. Uh, Jose Abreu, I, I saw yesterday, hit at least one ball very hard. Um, popped up at least one other one. So um, probably, I mean, he's 3,300, so we could play him in stacks for sure. Um, but hopefully Jose Abreu is going to start to come around and, and warm up a little bit because he has been dreadful. Corey Jolks, plenty of pop from the right side down at the bottom of the lineup. Jake Myers, plenty of pop as well. He's hitting about 275, 280, and he's got some power upside. So uh, I think we could play some Houston here, really top to bottom. Everybody but Martin Maldonado, even though he's 2,100, he is not an offensive piece. He is just in there for defense. So um, really 1-8, to eight, I think, is is playable. And if you need a 2,100 catcher, yeah, sure, go ahead. But uh, I think we can attack some stripling here with mostly Houston and, and some Luis Garcia on the mound as well. But if you want to get to some Giants pieces in tournaments, uh, I think that's perfectly fine. They're tournament play. And like these guys are, they're they're not cash plays by any means. They hit hit the ball in the air, they walk a good bit, and and they strike out a lot. So uh, three true outcome type of guys are are really only suitable in tournaments. Okay, Reds and the Padres, seven K for Luke Weaver. I'm not intrigued with this price tag really at all. Um, ugh, I I really don't like it. However, the early going here. As, as we kind of talked about in the opening, the strikeout stuff has been intriguing, to say the least. Uh, six innings, eight Ks against Pittsburgh. Did give up those four runs, as we mentioned. Um, but 
that was in the first inning, and he went a full five. I think it was before he even got an out that he gave up four runs. But um, went a full six and, and struck out eight. I mean, it's very encouraging against Pittsburgh. And five and two-thirds also struck out eight against Texas. So did give up six runs there. So the, the suppression uh, is really what we're worried about. Um, and we talked a little bit about this, so we'll probably try and keep this one short. But uh, I think we can play the Padres here and Luke Weaver. Um, I'm not super thrilled with, with 7K against Padres, but here in the early going, here's the numbers on them against right-handers. 25.5% K rate, full 12% walk rate. That's, that's, a, that's a big number. So uh, they're still getting on base and starting to hit for a little bit more power. We're seeing this this ISO number creep up for them. 32% hard contact, 15% soft contact. So a lot of medium plus and, and hard contact here for the pods, as, as we kind of expect. Now with Tatis back and their first, place, first base platoon with Matt Carpenter and even a little bit of Nelly Cruz against righties this year has been really strong. Uh, Juan Soto has not been good, but um, hopefully the elevation has allowed him to see the baseball a little bit better uh, over over the weekend. And I think the Padres are a far more playable tournament stack than the than the Giants because you know despite the fact that they walk a lot, they strike out a lot, and hit for power, they will create and there's much less variance with the Padres than for the Giants because they, as we can see here, have just a 15% homer to fly ball rate. Um, way fewer runs and much less of their production is actually coming via the homer. So that makes, that certainly makes the Giants a, a good tournament stack, right? But um, if you were looking for full stacks to get there, then something like the Padres might be a, a bit more of an attractive target because they will hit the baseball on a line a little bit more. But they also have the power, 175 ISO, and they're going to walk and, and get on base as well. So um, I think a little bit more intriguing of a full stack target, probably just one-off pieces I would prefer with the Giants or short stacks. Um since the, the suppression really hasn't quite been there for Luke Weaver just yet. But as I mentioned, the, the eight K's in, um, in back-to-back starts against two pretty respectable lineups, Pittsburgh and Texas. Uh, Pittsburgh really hasn't been striking out all that much. Texas may be a little bit more, but um, this is some of the best case stuff we've seen from Luke Weaver pretty much his entire career. And I, I guess going back to his very early Cardinals days, um, so intriguing for sure, and just a six-game slate. If you want to, if you land on a Luke Weaver here, I don't think it's the worst play in the world. I think I'd side with the Padres, despite the elevation drop and and all that kind of jazz that we talked about uh, with San Francisco. Um, but I I think you can play both sides here as well. Would prefer to get to the Padres because I'm I'm not totally sure that this is who Luke Weaver is, with a, a lot of K stuff. And he's more of a uh, kind of a middle of the rotation type of guy that's going to give up a few runs, maybe a little short of a K in inning type of guy. Um, good control, so he's not going to walk people and put anybody on base uh, necessarily, but um, still get a pitch to a, a bit more contact. So I think I want to see a little bit more from Luke Weaver before I start smashing him every day, and I'm convinced that he's a a 1.3 K in inning guy. Um, and I'm I'm kind of expecting the the Padres to really start heating up here as Tatis is getting getting some more abs under his belt. Uh, Blake Snell on the mound, 8,500 for the Pods, 50% ownership. I mentioned that we'll probably have to eat some of this today. Um, and and I think even having talked through a couple of guys already, I think we're probably still going to have to eat some of this. 24, 23% K rate for the Reds so far this season. Short of 300 PAs, but starting to converge a little bit. About 84 WRC+. plus, No power. So uh, I think this is an attackable spot for Blake Snell. Um, a lot of medium, medium contact here. Sub-26% aggregate hard contact rate against lefties so far. 
and just kind of an average walk rate. Now, the, the problem, as we talk about with Blake Snell, every single start is he elevates his pitch count by walking people. He only goes five innings, and sure enough, in his last uh, three starts, um, five innings, five innings, five innings, right? Three and two-thirds before that, four and a third before that. So this this is who Blake Snell is. He, he throws a lot of pitches, and he it's pretty rare that he makes it more than – that, that he makes it out of uh, a sixth inning or something like that. But I think this is a plus matchup for him, definitely. Now, I'd be careful with this ownership, of course. On a six-game slate, the easiest way to get different is just fade the chalkiest pitcher. And Blake Snell has a lot of variance with him because of the high walk rate in the in the pitch count. Now, there's, of course, the, the strikeout rate. So he gets himself out of a lot of these issues. Uh, but he is super frustrating and... The Reds here, they could still make a little bit of contact. They've got a guy, a bunch of guys here that they can platoon with. Johnny India, Spencer Steer, Fairchild, Stevenson, Henry Ramos. I mean, they can go a full nine righties here in the lineup. And despite the 31% K rate, still a, he's got an 11% walk rate, gives up an 075 ground ball to fly ball to the right side with hard contact. 37 and a half percent to lefties and 35 percent to righties these are big big numbers so when he's walking people and giving up a lot of hard contact and not inducing any soft contact sub 15 percent and to to both sides uh these are worrisome and he's got the he's got the four seamer so when he's plus value on the four seamer in terms of you know variance it can be a fine pitch, and he's got the really, really good slider. It's always been his best pitch. Um, but the curveball is just marginal and really doesn't have a changeup. So if he's walking people and the Reds are going to platoon with nine righties against him, uh, this could be a little bit susceptible, or he could be a little bit susceptible, um, and this could be a little bit of a sneaky spot for a couple of these Reds. Now, I don't really want to go out of my way and and stack against snow but this is a six game slate you can do it and he is the most popular pitcher as i mentioned that's the easiest way to get leverage on a very short slate is by stacking against a high variance arm uh with you know with the the plus side of their platoon against him so it's very viable to once again play both sides here uh, i definitely side with snell i think the price tag here is, is probably a bit too good uh, relative to everybody else on the slate. And certainly the, the median projection is agreeing with that so far. Markets are certainly saying the same. So um, if this pushes to north of 50, I think maybe you want to consider taking some, some red short stacks against him on the other side. Um, unfortunately, Johnny India is still at 4,800 kind of an unplayable price tag still for him but spencer steel steer is still at 3000 very playable there fairchild 23 playable there as well tyler stevenson power hasn't really quite um returned just yet 4200 for him not my favorite price adjusted play but a, a fine uh, a fine catcher play as well henry ramos he'll hit for both sides and kevin newman has actually been pretty decent uh, against lefties so far this season. So uh, Nick Senzel looks healthy, and they've got a couple of guys down at the bottom of the lineup, high upside prospect, certainly in uh, Jose Barrero for them. So you can play some Reds here and, and go after some Blake Snell. I don't think it's the worst play in the world. Would side with Snell in definitely like 30% of my teams or something like that. Um, you know, if if this comes down, Add to about 30%. I'd like to get leverage and get over on that. But um, as is, I, I think coming in somewhere near the field with this, probably under on this elevated ownership here so far, but um, undoubtedly a pretty good whiff matchup for him and suppression matchup if he can just freaking throw strikes. Okay, Taiwan Walker on the mound for the Phils against uh, Tony Gonsolin and the Dodgers. Um, Gonsolin, once again, we can probably get through him pretty quickly. Unlikely to go super deep into this game and he gets the Philly. So I don't think this is a, a viable target on the mound in most instances. And he's seeing 25% ownership right now. I think this is way too high. I'd be very, very surprised if he threw more than 
than five innings here. He was limited to four, and they yanked him after three and a third. Um, he, so he's still on a pitch count, and I'm not playing Dave Roberts shenanigans games um, over here with a guy who they need to be healthy, so they cannot push him here. Their starting pitching staff has been dreadful um, really over the last few weeks. The only guy that's providing any value is Kershaw. And even Luis Urias has gotten pieced apart in his last couple of starts. So um, their bullpen's been terrible. And unfortunately, you know, they, they need to keep Gonsolin healthy. So if they push him here, I mean, they're going to be very careful, I would assume. Um, so even at 6800 I, I mean, I like the price tag and I like the general upside for Gonsolin. But uh, this median projection looks a bit too high in that instance. I'd much rather go play a... Luke Weaver, who I'm pretty sure is is not on a pitch count or anything, and it, it just as difficult a matchup, I would say, Phillies versus San Diego, but we don't have to deal with uh, with any pitch count issues. So, um, I think I'd I'd rather do that at uh, much lower ownership. I think a third of the ownership here. Yeah, give me Luke Weaver instead of Tony Gonsolin. Uh, for the fill, 7,600 for Taiwan Walker. We talked about he had some forearm tightness. Um, Got to be careful with that because we saw with a guy like uh, Herman Marquez. Um, we've seen it with DeGrom as well. Forearm tightness is never a, a good omen for a pitcher, and we have to be aware that you know if, if guys are coming out with some tightness in a start, even though they make their next start, doesn't mean that they're totally healthy. Um, exact same thing happened with Herman Marquez. He had some forearm tightness, came out, actually spent, uh, whatever it was, 15 days on the DL, came back, made his next, next start, and very likely is going to need TJ. Um, so we, you got to be aware of that. And when we're just eating, um, you know, eating a price tag on a guy, whatever he is, uh, there could be something very fundamentally wrong here. Now, I don't want to, you know, sound the alarm bells or anything, but um, because the the doctors very, very obviously know more than me. But it, it's just, you know, what the doctors are also aren't uh, out there gambling on this stuff. So um, 7,600 for Walker, it's a bad matchup, no matter how you slice it, batted ball-wise, because he's only got a 20.5% carry rate himself. Um, the suppression numbers are generally fine because he induces a little bit of soft contact, not so much to the left side, but a good bit from the right side. Um, walk rate is, eh, I mean, to the lefties, it's it's a full 10%. This is kind of worrisome here. And that's really because of the split. Um, it's good value and good swing and miss pitch, but it's not necessarily a, a strike throwing pitch. Like you, you want to bury the split here. And throw this out of the strike zone. So um, that's kind of where a, an elevated walk rate to the lefties comes from. But hard contact numbers are fine. Sub 30% to both sides. Homer suppression numbers are fine. Hovering at, at one per to both sides per nine. And the ISO numbers. So 149 to lefties, 124 to righties. Both good numbers. So if you land on a Taiwan walker at 76 uh, well, it's a six-game slate. You can kind of do whatever you want. Um, but I would almost definitely side with the Dodgers here, and uh, I am a little gun-shy about playing any pitcher that has... Even, even Maybe I'm just um, a little torn up with the DeGrom and the Herman Marquez and all this kind of nonsense, but uh, I don't I don't like forearm tightness at all. Um, that suggests to me that something you know, quite ominous could be uh, lurking um, soon for, for a pitcher. So um, I'm not super crazy about uh, paying what should be you know, kind of an average price tag for Taiwan Walker uh, in a bad matchup with potential health concerns. Um, so I'm, so I'm just probably just going to stay off of this. And market kind of agreeing so far whether that is – incorporating some of the injury um, speculation. I really doubt it, but it's mostly just because of the bad ball matchup. So give me the Dodgers here. Um, I've been stagging them a lot recently, and they've 
<laughs> and they've uh, kind of disappointed overall, but uh, very playable price tags now. They're back healthy. They have Will Smith back behind the plate. He looks good. Uh, Max Muncy is back from the paternity list. Um, down at the bottom of the lineup, they're leaving a lot on the table. Like, they've got Jason Hayward as their five-hitter, you know. Um, David Peralta is really just a platoon bat for him anymore. And... They have been missing, uh, who have they been missing? Uh, Miguel Rojas for a few weeks now. So he should, I believe they're going to activate him today. Um, so he should be back. That will decrease their overall strikeout rate against right-handers this year. This is an alarming number and probably the highest number we've seen in the last decade for the Dodgers in aggregate. 25% against righties so far. Still walking a lot, still hitting for a lot of power. He's numbers similar to the Giants numbers. Uh, but the homer to fly ball rate about six ticks lower. So they're hitting the baseball more on a line, and most of that is coming from, like, uh, a Freddie Freeman, right? So uh, still creating at a huge clip, neutral ground ball to fly ball, and a lot of hard contact, 34.5% in aggregate, very little soft contact. So this is still a very difficult lineup to go after with guys that don't have a lot of whiff stuff themselves. Um, and Taiwan Walker certainly doesn't have that. So not dealing with any of the Gonsolin shenanigans. I'd like to kind of get after the Phillies because the Dodgers' bullpen has been dreadful. They've been they've thrown a lot of innings. They've been giving up production in spades. So um, give me just offense here, and I think this is a fine uh, a fine tournament stack. You're probably going to get the Phillies uh, pretty ignored, and maybe not so much with the Dodgers. But um, I think you can play both sides here in terms of offense, and probably no pitching for me. Uh, okay, so I think uh, we're probably at about an hour once again, so um, that'll do it for the breakdown. Uh, let's quickly go over over stacks. I think you could play some Guardians here against Domingo Herman. Elevated price tag, I'm, it seems a little fishy here. Even though I do like Herman uh, in general, um, I think the last several outings of his are probably a bit... Uh, outsized to his normal production range. Um, if you land on a Cal Quantrill, also not the worst play in the world. Probably some other guys in that same range I'd rather get to. Um, but, yeah, it, it's it's not horrible. Uh, it's pretty low on the list, though. Chicago and Washington. Give me Washington, definitely, uh, against Drew Smiley. I'm still looking to fade this. And give me some Mackenzie Gore on the mound. You can play the Cubs as well. There's a walk rate still a concern for, for Gore over here, despite the high strikeout rate. Cubs have been really good against lefties, too. Um, Toronto and Boston. Give me all of Boston, I think. And sure, you can play some Toronto as well. They're very expensive, hard to get there. But probably very little pitching on the mound. Maybe some Kluber, as a matter of fact. San Francisco and Houston. You can play both Houston and San Francisco. Prefer Houston. Um and give me some Luis Garcia as well. I think uh, at a depressed ownership, this number is probably going to increase quite a bit throughout the day, I would say. Um, but give me some Luis Garcia for sure. Cincy and San Diego. Oh, uh, boy. Um, I think you can play everybody here, to be quite honest. Uh, give me Snell, Padres, Weaver, then the Reds, I think. Um, but it, I think it's a little bit closer than... It would like it would appear on first blush. Um, you can play pretty much everybody there. I do like Snell though. Um, Philly and the Dodgers, and give me just offense down here. I'm really not interested in, in playing games. So that might be a nice uh, late night hammer for you. So uh, that's it, guys, for the breakdowns. Once again, keep an eye on the projection updates, um, and good luck if you are punting on this short Monday. <laughs>